Going over IRS Form 12203, Request for Appeals Review. Uh, normally, you probably won't see this uh, tax form unless one of two things has happened. One, you've received an audit uh, from the IRS uh, because they selected your tax return, and for some reason, they found something in the examination uh, that caused them to recommend changes to your tax return. This may or may not uh, in increase your tax bill, but most of the time that people uh, decide to uh, appeal is because it does, in fact, increase their tax liability. And then the second thing is that you have to uh, be able to have some reason to be able to, to uh, disagree with the IRS opinion. So basically, an IRS examiner has taken a look at your tax return. Uh, they've made one or more changes that you disagree with. And usually within the notice, you'll, you'll, you'll see a copy of this form. There will probably be some language that talks about what you can uh, do in, in the appeals process. And then, uh, and then there, will be a cop, uh, there will be some instructions uh, on how to file your appeal request. So generally speaking, um, it, whenever the IRS takes a position, they give you 30 days to appeal, but you'll want to double check your letter uh, to make sure that uh, this is indeed the case. So 30 days from the date of the letter, not necessarily the date that you received the letter or the notice, but the date of the letter itself. Uh, in, in any instance, you can always uh, call the IRS uh, uh, to get clarification on your tax issue, particularly if you've lost the notice. So we're going to go through this uh, form. The form itself is relatively straightforward, but then afterwards we're going to go over some situations where uh, this form is required and then some other uh, issues where you might appeal the process, uh, but you might use a different form instead. So uh, in our article, we break this down into three sections, the taxpayer information at the top, uh, the um, items of disagreement in the middle, and then signatures at the bottom. So uh, we'll briefly go over this information. So in this case, John Doe, his uh, taxpayer ID number, which can be his uh, social security number, it can be his uh, individual taxpayer ID number if he does not have a social security number or in the case of a small business owner it could be an employer ID number uh, but generally since uh, partnerships and S corporations are not allowed to use this uh, form to uh, file an appeal uh, it's going to be individual uh, ID numbers so uh, in the address here uh, City, state, and zip code, uh, tax form number. Uh, so in this case, he's appealing his 1040 for 2023 tax year. And then he's going to list his phone number and the best time to call so that the IRS uh, can call, presumably to um, request a, an informal conference. That's generally the desired result so that you can... Uh, you know, have the appeals uh, office take a look at uh, your situation uh, and, and why you disagree. So in the middle, you're going to identify the item or items that you disagree with. You're going to explain why you disagree, and you can add additional information if the space uh, allowed is not sufficient. So in this case, uh, John Doe's appealing, you know, an IRS decision to disallow his head of household status. He's stating that he meets the criteria. Uh, presumably, he would have an understanding of the tax code, IRS regulations. He would understand, you know, how you would qualify as a head of household uh, versus situations where he would not be considered head of household. You know, so that's an example. Uh, you can list as many items as you want, and you can include more copies of this form if you need to uh, put in additional items. But a couple of, uh, I guess, notes, right? So first, you 
you do need to have a, a relevant reason why you think you're right. Uh, if you're just doing this to postpone the IRS collections process and you're making frivolous or, uh, you know, not credible arguments, the IRS can come back and hold that against you. Uh, you know, unreasonable tax positions and, and things of that nature. Uh, so uh, you should at least have a good faith uh, measure that you're that you're in the right. And you should be uh, confident that you have uh, the documentation in your records and, you know, that you have at least, you know, an authority somewhere, either in the tax code, uh, in I, uh, the Treasury regulations, the IRS uh, uh, revenue uh, rulings and procedures. Uh, we list all of the different sources of authority. Uh, you need to be able to do this in uh you know, on your own behalf. Uh, and, and I'll take a pause right here and say, this is why most people probably appoint uh, a power of attorney. So, you know, a tax attorney, uh, uh, an enrolled agent or a certified public uh, accountant can all be designated to represent you in these matters. First, uh, they're going to know whether or not they can support you. And, you know, uh, if they do believe that they can support you, they're going to know what the what information the IRS is going to need so that they can uh, represent you in this. And then third, they can do the heavy lifting for you. So there are three reasons why you might consider having a tax professional. Uh, so with uh, uh, with representation before the IRS, only a tax professional can represent you. Uh, if you filed a tax return with a uh, tax preparer, that person can attend meetings, but they cannot represent you even if uh, they were the person that completed your tax return. So only uh, an, an attorney, a CPA, or an enrolled agent. And even then, you have to have completed IRS Form 2848, which is the power of attorney and declaration of representative form. Uh, so if you do have that person appointed, they would sign right here. In this case, John Doe is going to sign and date the bottom. Uh, you can make this 2024, for example. Uh, and then his uh, uh, CPA, James Smith, would sign and date and enter his information here. Uh, basically, this grants the IRS inf uh, permission to contact his power of attorney directly. So uh, on the back is just a s short synopsis of, you know, some of the high hitters. So... You can use this form when your exam or your audit was $25,000 or less uh, uh, per tax period. So uh, this gets a little bit complicated, but basically the IRS means um, for a given tax year, for example, if your uh, proposed adjustments were $25,000 or less, that includes any penalties and interest that the IRS decided to assess, then you can use this form uh, to file uh, what would be considered small case procedure. Uh, and so uh, there, there are quite a few different pages on the IRS website uh, that talk a little bit more about small, small case requests versus a formal protest. So in this case, this is the form, IRS Form 12203, to make a small case request. Anything above and beyond that would be considered a formal protest, which needs to be uh, done within a certain time period. And it excludes any cases that are more than $25,000 and that uh, involve certain tax matters. So basically, if you receive this form or if you receive a notice saying that you can use this form, then you can use it. If you don't see anything that says you can use this form, then I would call the IRS before trying to file this form out. Um, so uh, there are other situations where you might be thinking, hey, I can appeal the IRS uh, in this situation when in fact a different form would be uh, uh, more appropriate. So we're gonna take a look at some of these uh, situations. Uh, we're gonna focus on uh, three of them here. Uh, so the collection, so these are collection decisions. And so uh, the Form 12203 is a request for an appeals review. Uh, it has not gotten to the collections process yet, 
and it won't as long as you're still appealing this part of the tax process. Now, if you're actually in the collections process where, um, you know, the IRS is looking to issue a levy notice or has issued a levy notice, a lien, something of that nature, then it's going to fall into one of several different categories. So the collection appeals program uh, is a collection process where you might have received a tax lien notice or a levy notice or that you applied for an installment agreement and the IRS rejected it, terminated it, um, modified it, uh, you know, something like that. And so you, you would receive a notice explaining the situation and you'll probably receive a copy of IRS form 9423 that's requesting the collection appeals uh, request. And so you would send that to the revenue officer and then you would have, um, there is a different route for that. Uh, unfortunately, if you um, disagree with the appeals decision at your cap hearing, you can't appeal to tax court. And any forms that we mention here, we're gonna put links in the show notes in case you stumbled upon this video by accident will redirect you to the correct form. The collection due process hearing is one where you will request uh, specifically a due process uh, from the Office of Appeals. So uh, your right to a hearing under Internal Revenue Code 6320, if you received a final notice of intent to levy, a notice of jeopardy and your uh, jeopardy levy and your right to appeal or state tax refund levy, uh, so that would be a different one. Uh, you have 30 days from the date of the notice to request your CDP hearing. You can still file IRS Form 12153 after that. It's considered an equivalent hearing, uh, which is very similar, but there are a couple of rights that you're not guaranteed under an equivalent hearing. An offer and compromise, if for some reason you uh, submitted an offer and compromise, which is an agreement between you and the IRS uh, to settle your tax bill for less than the full amount that you owed. If the IRS rejected that, you can appeal that decision uh, within 30 days and you would file IRS form uh, 13711, which is the request for an appeal of offer and compromise. So we'll put links in the show notes to those references. Uh, and in our article, we also break down uh, this uh, in a little bit more detail uh, so you, you get a better understanding of when you can use this form, how you would file it, which uh, basically uh, you should have the information that you need to file it in the letter that you received. Uh, so if you don't, then you need to call the IRS. And uh, unless your letter states otherwise, just assume that you have 30 days from the date of the letter uh, to be able to submit this to uh, the appeals. So uh, there is not a whole lot of guidance on the IRS website and, and the guidance that is there is in about several dozen different places. So this video is my best guess to try and put everything I can into one, uh, into one format. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll put links in the show notes to the articles and videos we've created about some of the other forms mentioned here uh, in case you uh, hit upon a point that might cause you to go in a different direction. Uh, so if you like our articles, please uh, subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our YouTube videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or comments, or if there's another topic that you'd like to see in an upcoming video, please hit me up in the comments section. Thank you very much and have a great day.